Well, good morning and welcome to Corona Chronicles 2.1. We're heading into the book of Habakkuk for the next part of the Corona Chronicles. And this devotion will run through from Tuesdays to a Saturday. So it's a bit different from our last series of devotions. And we're going back to a time in history more than 2,600 years ago. A book that was written by a prophet prophesying great turmoil. A human being just like you and I. I've entitled this introduction Turmoil. Because for Habakkuk, what he saw was this moral degeneration in the in Judah where he was after a good king had died and his children started to take over and he was questioning God. Why does it seem that you've turned your face on us? And then God says, don't worry, I'm going to punish Judah because of their sin. And um, I'm going to send the Chaldeans who were even worse than what Judah was. And so Habakkuk goes, well, thanks that you're just and that you're going to punish sin. But how can you use a nation worse than our nation to punish us? And so there was great turmoil inside of this book. This was a human being just like you and I are with questions that are just as relevant today as when this book was first written. And there's so many good lessons for us to learn that we're still learning. These are lessons that Habakkuk needed to learn. And I'm so I'm very excited for us to get into this wonderful book. And let me get right into verse 1 of Habakkuk. I encouraged our local church to read through the book of Habakkuk. So if you're not part of our local church, then maybe just push pause and read through the book of Habakkuk. It will take you really, really, really long, like as long as Psalm 119. No, Habakkuk is only three chapters long. And so we're going to be studying a very small book. He's called one of the minor prophets. And that doesn't mean that what they say is any less valuable than what the major prophets are. The major prophets are called that because they have more content in the books that they wrote, whereas the minor prophets had less content. But what they say is still just as much inspired by God and just as much applicable to you and I even today. And so let's look at Habakkuk 1 verse 1. There are three chapters in this book, as I mentioned, and uh, we'll head into this. So if you haven't read it, pause, read through Habakkuk and then unpause. Habakkuk 1 verse 1 says the oracles that Habakkuk the prophet saw. The oracles. What does oracle mean? The term oracle is used in the Old Testament. And it mostly speaks about the judgment and the wrath of God against sin. The King James of this version uses the word the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And when you think of the burden, it's something that is heavy, something that is a weighty, something that is difficult that they're going through. And as a side note, just as part of our introduction, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, this is what Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we come to Jesus, we're actually able to find peace. But as the opening verse of this section, this is the burden which Habakkuk Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. He has a prophecy about something that is really weighty, about the judgments of God. This depicts the idea of this heavy load which is taken up so that it... This is why the book of Habakkuk is such a heavy book in that sense. It's a prophetic book which shows a heavy load upon the author of this book. And the prophecy within the book is a burdensome one for the people of Israel, for in it are declared calamities that were to come upon the people of Israel through the Chaldeans. They were a terrible people. This was the start of the Babylonian Empire. These were this this, this brought much fear even and trembling to Habakkuk. And so this had tremendous weightiness, these three chapters. And part of the question that Habakkuk has for God <clears throat> is why is there wickedness that's just rampant and it seems like, God, you're doing nothing about it. And then God says, yes, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to punish this wickedness by sending the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk has an issue with that. How can you send a nation worse than our nation to punish 
a nation less worse than them? <laughs> so this is part of the question that Habakkuk has for God. And it's why he would even use, um, why would God use even more wicked people? So it's a book hard to swallow, which propels us towards the sovereignty of God and God's sufficiency for his people. This is going to be a book that is going to be so fitting for what we're facing, even as a country and as we go through lockdown. There's turmoil around us. There may be questions that you have as a child of God. Does it seem like God is maybe forsaking us or that he's not doing something in our day? Well, God willing, through the book of Habakkuk and our studies, briefly morning after morning, God will use it to shape us towards trusting in his sovereignty and leaning on his sufficiency. That Habakkuk, and that's the next words that we look at in our introduction, who is Habakkuk anyway? Well, nothing really is known much about Habakkuk as a person other than he is a prophet. That's all that is really told to us in this book, which which may mean that he didn't need much of an introduction and most likely was already accepted as a prophet in his time. He may have given many verbal prophecies that were not inscribed into scripture and he was accepted already by the people as Habakkuk the prophet. Kind of like people around in, or in, at least in Benoni Bible Church, know me as Rocky, the pastor of the church. I didn't need much of an introduction to the people in our congregation. But it means that he may have already made many prophecies already and known as a prophet to the people. And this book of three chapters, though, is all the prophecy that is recorded by Habakkuk in all of Holy Scripture. He was a contemporary to Jeremiah, contemporary meaning that these men lived more or less around the same time as what Habakkuk did. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel and Zephaniah. These were the contemporaries. Daniel towards the end of the life of uh, of Habakkuk and to, Daniel would have gone into the actual captivity that Habakkuk was busy prophesying about and Zephaniah, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. The mention of the Chaldeans in verse 7 of chapter 1 indicates for us that this was a book that was written between the time of 612 to 609 BC, more than 2600 years ago. They were really, this really, this time in history was the starting point of the Babylonian Empire rising to fame. And Habakkuk prophesied during the final days of the Assyrian Empire and the beginning of the Babylonian world rulership. Remember that the Assyrians conquered the northern tribes of Israel in 722 BC. And then the Babylonians conquered the Assyrian Empire in 609 BC. And you'll remember that God halted the attack of the Assyrians because there was a revival that started to happen spiritually for the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And so the Assyrians were, they lost thousands of their troops because God broke out against them in a plague. I believe it was around 120,000 people that died of the armies of Assyria and God halted them. They'd already wiped out most of Judah and they were besieging Jerusalem itself. And you can go and read a bit more about that. I believe it's uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 even that talks about um, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And the, the, the Israelites began to start having a superstition thinking that because of him having the temple, that's why God halted this. But it was actually because there was a reform that happened. And God in his kindness held back his wrath. And we're going to see a little bit about that even in this um, passage and what we're looking at this morning. And so there was this... The, the Babylonian Empire starts to take over from the Assyrian Empire in 609 BC when they had destroyed the capital city of the Assyrians, which is Nineveh, in 612 BC. And that forced the Assyrian mobility to take refuge in their next largest city, which was Haran, which the Babylonians then conquered in 609 BC, causing the Assyrian nobility to retreat even further to their next largest city called Karakesmish, 
which eventually was destroyed by the Babylonians also in 605 BC under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. And so you can see that the Chaldeans were more and more conquering the world. And this is the, the world empire that's starting to to really ramp up its attack on the world. The Egyptian king Necho traveled through Judah in 609 BC to assist the fleeing Assyrian king and was opposed by King Josiah at Megiddo. And you can go and read about this at, in 2 Chronicles 35 verse 20 to 24. Second Chronicles 35, 20 to 24, and you'll see the way that Josiah is injured in battle because he did not listen to King Necho. It was God who had sent King Necho to assist the Assyrian king that was fleeing. I'm not sure for what reason, and it's very fascinating. Maybe I should just read that to you. Second Chronicles 35, 20 to 24. After all this, when Josiah was prepared and um, had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Shemesh on the Ethio, um, on the Euphrates and Josiah went out to meet him but he sent envoys to him saying what have we to do with each other king of Judah I'm not coming against you this day but against the house with which I am at war and God has commanded me to hurry see supposing God who is with me lest he destroy you imagine this the the Pharaoh of Egypt telling Josiah, who was a godly king, God has sent me to go and do what I'm busy doing. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God. And so we have confirmation from scripture that God had sent the Egyptian king up and actually had warned Josiah through Necho not to get involved in this. And from so he did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plains of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servant, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servant took him out of the chariot and carried him to his second chariot and brought him to Jerusalem. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his fathers. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. It's just after this where Josiah's sons start to reign after him. Josiah was killed in battle, leaving his throne to a succession of three sons and a grandson, wicked men. And earlier, upon discovering the book of the law in the temple in 622 BC, Josiah had instituted significant religious reforms in Judah. And you can go and read about Josiah's reforms in 2 Kings chapter 22 as well as chapter 23. I'm not going to read all of it, but I want to read some of it to you to see the kind of reforms that happened underneath Josiah and the religious reforms. There was a wonderful time of prosperity in Judah. and They had a godly king, but this godly king did not listen to God when he came up against the Egyptian king. So look with me there at 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And this is speaking about the start of the reign of King Josiah. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah and um, Bozkath. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. This was a godly king. If you look down at 2 Kings 22, 11 to 13, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. God's word had been lost in Judah and it was there in the temple and they found a copy of God's word. And as it was read, this man tore his clothes and the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and Ahikam, the son of Shephan, and Akbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shephan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that have that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is 
written concerning us. Josiah discerned there's wrath of God that is busy, that is going to be coming out against Judah and Jerusalem because they've not been obeying God's word. And then in 2 Kings 22, 15 to 20, listen to what is said when they inquire of the Lord. And she said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, and that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath has kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent. This is such a key section from verse 19 of 2 Kings chapter 22. Because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they, sh and they brought back the word to the king. And look at the great revival of Josiah. If you go and read from 2 Kings 23 from verse 1 to 20, I'm not going to read that part to you, but go read that at home and see the wonderful reforms of Josiah and see these religious reforms which Josiah accomplished, the way that he killed all the false prophets and the, the zeal that burned in him for the name of the Lord. He got rid of the idols and the false worship in Judah and the Lord blessed this king. And he averted God's wrath during Josiah's reign, his 32 years, which their sin had deserved. The Syrian empire was halted by God even before destroying Jerusalem. And God made a wonderful shift, even economically, and he gave wonderful blessing under Josiah's reign. Fascinating. If you look at verse 21, of um, chapter 22 of second kings this is a fascinating section verse 21 from there and the king commanded all the people keep the passover of the lord your god as it is written in the book of the covenant we've just gone through the time of passover easter for us as christians for no such passover has been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel, or during all the days of the kings of Israel, or of the kings of Judah. And now, by God's providence, during the lockdown, we were prohibited from gathering to celebrate the time of Easter as a church, where our Lord was crucified, the, the perfect spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We were prohibited from that. But for these people, what Josiah was saying is, even since the time of the judges, the Passover wasn't had. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. 13 years old, 18 years later, and you have a 31-year-old man who's now king of Israel, this is wonderful reform, as you think even of our Lord Jesus starting his earthly ministry at about 30, 31. What a wonderful thing this is. This first Passover was held since the days of the judges. There was mighty reform. Look at verse 24 of um, 2 Kings chapter 22. And you'll see, moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest, found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him. This is what God's word says about Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. That is a wonderful profession about Josiah. There was no king like him before, including King David, and there was no king who rose over the throne of Judah 
after him who was like him. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath, but which by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah out of my sight, and I have as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off the city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said my name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In the days of Pharaoh, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo. As soon as he saw him and his servants carried him dead in a chariot from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. This is a very short reign. His mother's name was Hamatel, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bonds at Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Elakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exalt he exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land from everyone according to his assignment to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebida and the, the daughter of Pediah of Rumah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. But upon Josiah's death, the nation of, of Judah reverted back to its evil ways. And this is the time that Habakkuk begins to prophesy. It's under the reigning of, of Josiah's two evil sons and the third evil son. And he looks at this and he's going, but why, Lord? We had such prosperity and we had a good king. And, and now we have evil reigning. And this is how the son of Josiah behaved and the punishment that awaited him. If you look at this in Jeremiah 22, 14 to 19, who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. Do you think you are a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. It was well with Josiah when he did justice. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord? Do you see the connection between this and James when James says, What is true and undefiled religion? Listen to what he says here. He, talking about Josiah, he judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord? Knowing me is doing what Josiah was doing. But you have eyes and heart only for your dishonest gain, Jehoiakim, Kim. For shedding innocent blood and for practicing ob oppression and violence. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him saying, ah, oh, my brother, or ah, oh, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, ah, oh, Lord, or ah, oh, his majesty. With the burial of a donkey, he shall be buried, dragged and dumped beyond the gates of Jerusalem. There's, there's not even going to be a funeral profession. They're going to tie him to a donkey. Somebody's going to lead that donkey and dump the body. That's the way this man's burial would be. And this is what caused Habakkuk's first question to God, because he wondered why it seemed that God had allowed Jerusalem and Judah to descend into wickedness and ruin. 
So this is who Habakkuk was in the era that he lived, a transitional period politically in world politics from the Assyrian Empire to the Babylonian Empire and a transitional person from Judah, from this righteous king to an unrighteous king, which would eventually lead to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC because of the wickedness of the people and the judgment of God, his wrath being against Jerusalem and its inhabitants. When you see in verse 1, it's speaking about Habakkuk the prophet. It means that this book carries weight and we should pay attention to what this book speaks about for this man speaks as it were God's very word, the word of God. And even for us as a church, as we study this through our time of devotions, let us remember that all scripture is God breathed. So the book of Habakkuk has as much truth today as it did when it was first penned. May God help us as we study through it. There are times where you may have questions like Habakkuk has had. What is the Lord doing even in our country today, even with the corona crisis and underneath lockdown? And the big call for us through the book of Habakkuk is to trust God. So dear church, we're going to be striving through this book to trust God, for God knows what he is doing through history, and his plans and his purposes cannot be thwarted. And through his purposes, though his purposes may be hidden from us as we live in this time, he is at work. The title of the book takes the name of the prophet, and it is significant in many respects, for the name Habakkuk means the one who embraces. That's what it means. And at the moment, we're not allowed to even embrace one another. We're in social distancing. And so I'm hoping that the book of Habakkuk really embraces your heart at a time like this. And we need to be people who embrace the sovereignty of God. And Habakkuk himself depicts his confusion concerning God's plan for his people. But he embraces the sovereignty of God and the sovereign control of God. May we be a people that embrace the sovereignty and God's control and that we would even receive comfort in our own questioning as we begin this journey through the book of Habakkuk. May God bless our time studying his wonderful word. Amen.